warm welcome to everyone tuning in this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, across the country on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Libby Davies and I'm the host of Off the Hill, Rabble.ca's political commentary panel. Off the Hill addresses current issues of national significance from a progressive and critical viewpoint. It's great to be back, especially on the eve of a federal budget. In fact, the first federal budget since the pandemic began. I'm very delighted to welcome back our regular panelists. First of all, Carl Nerenberg, Rabble.ca's award-winning political correspondent. Leah Gazan, the terrific member of parliament for Winnipeg Center. Welcome to both Carl and Leah. And Paul Taylor, I'm not sure if he's actually joined us yet, but if he hasn't, he will be here shortly. Uh, Paul Taylor is the executive director of Foodshare Toronto. And our special guest, a, a really good welcome to economist Jim Stanford, who is the director of the Center for Work. Hello to all of our panelists. And a special welcome to Robin Brown, who is joining me as alternating co-host of Off the Hill. Uh, just to let you know a, a little bit about Robin, Robin co-leads the 613-819 Black Hub, a Black political advocacy group in Ottawa. So it's great that you can be with us today, Robin, and I'm delighted that we'll be alternating and co-hosting these panel discussions in the future. So thanks a lot, Libby. Great to be here. Okay, great to see you, uh, Robin, and I'll come back to you later in the show, okay? So let's jump in, everybody. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, you can participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And for sure, we're going to do our very best to address your questions because we do want to hear from you. From, for those of you watching on Facebook, a welcome to you. Well, you know, it's hard to imagine a year ago that today we would still be facing a global pandemic and a mass vaccination program in the middle of a third wave of the pandemic, trying to outrun a fourth wave. The pandemic has changed everything from how we view our healthcare and how we treat our elders to workers' rights, the power of big pharma, our schools, our economy, and of course the impact on individual lives and inequality. It's crunch time in Ottawa. The climate crisis is more serious than ever and cannot be put on the back burner. This upcoming federal budget has a unique place in history. It, it kind of feels to me like it's a pivotal moment. So I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists the same question to each of you. And it's, it's this, what does this pivotal moment mean to you personally, to the work you do and for Canada as a whole? Um, now is, is uh, Paul on the call yet? Yes, he is. Yeah, okay. Well, Paul, welcome. Uh, glad that you're here. And we're going to start off with you. So, yeah, what does this pivotal moment mean to you personally and for the work you do and for Canada? Let's start, let's start with you. Ah, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here again, uh, Libby, and to see uh, my friends, the, uh, the co-panelists. Um, you know, this moment represents, I think, um, an opportunity to address all of the inequities that we've been spending decades talking about. But I, 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 you know, I say that, but I also, I, I'm not too, you know, I think the big problem is we've all been burned by this government and their promises before. You know, we hear these promises of bold transformational progressive change and we're hearing, you know, inklings of that as we lead up to the budget on the 19th. But these big promises that they often make end up being a whole lot of nothing, you know, or snail's pace, snail's pace incremental tinkering and business as usual. So, you know, while I feel like this is a moment for bold transformational change, it's a moment for us to really think about what kind of Canada uh, this country can be, what the future for all, us all looks like, how we advance human rights. I'm not excited and I'm not going to believe what they're selling. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm not buying it. And I'm, I, I've decided that I'm just not going to get excited by their vote getting schemes. You know, it's not good for my blood pressure. I was excited about electoral reform. I was excited about tackling climate change. I was, you know, sunny ways. You know, it, 
the, you know, they took photos with Greta. Instead, they used their money to buy a pipeline, give away more oil and gas subsidies, 18 billion, we heard today, and then continue to delay, you know, promised action on murdered and missing indigenous women and women and girls, not to mention the boil water advisories, long list of other things. So I'm actually not as excited as I think the moment dictates. Yeah, I know how you feel. Um, Leah, let's go to you. How are you feeling about this particular moment as you approach uh, the upcoming federal budget? What does it mean to you, both personally and for your writing and, and, and your constituents? Well, I think it's important to note that those that were behind before the pandemic are even further behind. We know there's targeted populations, certainly BIPOC folks. Uh, we, we knew this before the pandemic. I think if anything the pandemic has done is it have it has highlighted these inequalities because now when you don't look after somebody it impacts everybody in the circle so the well-being of all will impact our ability to get through the pandemic and you know i have to agree with my good friend paul here i'm not excited uh universal uh child care program and national child care program almost 30 years they've been promising it they voted down the, our pharma kill Farmer care bill, Bill C-13, and now they're promising during their convention, they're talking uh, about a pharma care program. They've totally, totally uh, gone against promises on dealing with the climate emergency, mm -hmm. investing billions in dollars in pipelines and non-renewable resources. Uh, instead of heeding uh, their promises. And let's not forget their willful human rights violations. They have indicated that they will not honor the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling to stop, immediately stop uh, racially discriminating against uh, First Nations children on reserve and housing. You know, the PBO report just came out. I know for my writing, we are short 9,000 units for Indigenous individuals and families and core housing needs. And they are billions of dollars behind being able to address this crisis. So I'm not very hopeful. Um, I, I think I'm just gonna keep focused on fighting for human rights because certainly this government hasn't done what it needs to do to respect human rights, including the human right uh, for a safe, healthy and clean environment as a human right. Thanks, Leah. And I'm, I'm going to turn to Jim next. We're going to get um, specifically into the federal budget and what we want to see and what we need to see. Um, but Jim and then Carl, um, just any thoughts you want to add about, you know, the sense of this moment that we're in because we haven't had a federal budget um, during the pandemic. So we're way behind. So, it, you know, all eyes are on Ottawa. Any thoughts on that, Jim? Well, uh, it is certainly a historic moment, Libby. We've been making history, all of us, for the last year. Uh, in, our, in our lifetimes, we've never seen anything like this, and hopefully we never will again. Uh, both the scale of the, of the catastrophe, the health and the social catastrophe, and the economic catastrophe, and the incredibly unfair way that that burden has been shared. I, I mean, I, every recession is unfair. Every recession hurts those the most who can afford it the least. But this recession, uh, absolutely brutal in how the impacts, both the health impacts and the economic impacts were concentrated uh, on people who were already struggling uh, to get by. Uh, temporary workers, uh, people in precarious jobs, women, youth, uh, communities of color, of course, who are suffering both the worst of the health consequences of the pandemic and the economic consequences. So uh, for me personally, as a, as a progressive economist, it, it absolutely is a big kick in the ass to think big because there's no other way to confront this moment than to think really big with some really, uh, I think, far reaching and, and radical ideas about how the direction of the economy can be changed and, and not stand back and just wait for the system to collapse of its own accord. If there's anything leftists have learned in, in, the, in history, it should be that capitalism isn't gonna fall on its own, no matter how horrible the, the consequences are. We have to give it a great big push. And that means coming together uh, and building movements, demanding incremental changes, but also big changes. And, and this is a moment when we absolutely have to do that. Thanks, Jim. Um, yes, we do have to give capitalism a big kick in the ass and push it, that's for sure. Um, over to you, Carl. Just, I, I mean, you cover the Hill. You kind of watch the political optics going on. Any, any thoughts that you have just briefly on, uh, on what it's looking like leading up to uh, the budget in Ottawa? 
So, I mean, it's not so much leading only to the budget. What is distressing to me is, and what I had hoped early in the pandemic might be one result, a little less political and maybe more parliamentary, was that we would, rec you know, we early, when this pandemic started, the government basically said, we've got to go and do all kinds of stuff. And we want the opposition just to cut us a lot of slack because we're just going to be breaking all the rules. We're going to be short circuiting the process. We're going to make stuff happen. And I think the opposition part, I mean, especially without meaning because I have an NDP MP here, but, but, but especially the NDP, they took them at their word. They said, we're going to be constructive. We're going to be proposing, as you know, as um, uh, Jack Layton used to say, we're in the proposition business, not the opposition business. We're going to be looking at what you're doing and see how we can make it better. We're going to be proposing stuff to do. We're going to be regard this as a partnership and a team spirit. And um, now the spirit of team spirit seems to be ending. What's happened? I mean, what really deeply disappoints me is that we we haven't had the maturity to say the Canadian people elected 338 members of parliament from five different parties. Not a single one of those parties got more than half of those seats and uh, nobody got anywhere near, you know, a significant proportion of popular vote. The popular vote was very distributed throughout. And the Canadian I mean, Canadians, if we say there's a collective will, want the, these 338 members of parliament to figure things out and work together. I mean, the, in normal times when we've had uh, minority governments, we, we have this weird attitude in Canada, unlike say the Europeans, which is okay, parties will collaborate, we'll have coalitions and we'll govern. We think in Canada, oh, that was sort of like, uh, uh, the, the game ended in a tie, now we have to have a shootout. Parliament's not really parliament, it's just the shootout or the overtime period. And we're gonna see who's gonna really win and then, and then we're gonna have somebody's gonna get a majority. But we have kind of abandoned that because of the pandemic, but we're back to that now. Yeah, I'm going to jump in there. And, and it's right. really good you reminded us that it's a minority parliament, which of course is always a critical thing when it comes to a federal budget, because you know it's a, it's a vote of confidence uh, that means the government could fall if it doesn't get a majority. So let's, let's dive in now into Monday's federal budget. And I guess the question I've got is, what do we need to see? I think you've all been very articulate in pointing out you know, that we have a level of cynicism after so many promises from uh, liberal governments over the years. Um, but still there is this opportunity. So what do we need to see in this federal budget that will signal transformative economic changes where, you know, addressing the core issues of employment security, healthcare, rising inequality, the climate crisis, systemic racism, indigenous rights. Now, Jim, I'm going to jump back to you just to kind of give a bit of an overview in terms of, you know, kind of an economic view. And then I'm going to go to uh, Lear and Paul uh, to get your views about what we need to see in that budget. So Jim, over to you. Well, in terms of the sort of fiscal bread and butter that goes into a budget, revenue expenses and budget balances, uh, we are gonna see a budget unlike any other that we've seen in post-war history. We're gonna have an enormous uh, deficit recorded for the fiscal year that just ended, uh, something close to $400 billion for the year. And we're gonna have really big deficits for the foreseeable future. Uh, so that in and of itself marks a, a huge change. And there's been a huge change in the discourse. Well, you know, I agree with everyone's, um, you know, uh, cynicism and frustration with the Liberals not delivering on what they've promised. On the other hand, I think we should uh, to, to, in a way, recognize our own influence, take note of how the discourse has changed. And while there are those uh, who are still hoping for a return to austerity quickly, and we'll hear lots of doom and gloom about debt and deficit and so on, the reality is that uh, the, the fiscal discourse has changed completely. And that's a good thing because it does mean that the resources are there uh, to support things that needed to be done, including the emergency measures last year with the CERB and so on, but also what's uh, coming forward. Uh, now, uh, Freeland said that uh, she was setting aside 70 to $100 billion over the next three years uh, to support continued reconstruction after the pandemic. Um, you know, in the olden days, that was an awful lot of money. It doesn't sound like a lot now, 70 to 100, gosh, hardly worth it. 
but it is a lot of money. And uh, what we have to what we have to fight for and push for is to make sure that that vision of uh, post COVID reconstruction on an analogy almost to, to how we uh, came out of World War Two, I think there's a very strong parallel there to the national reconstruction and industry building and social welfare building and infrastructure building that happened after World War Two and that uh, Ash helped to create a whole generation of prosperity, we could do the same thing right now if we put our minds to it and our resources to it. But of course, it won't happen in, unless they're, they're pushed. So we, we have to see that they're still determined to spend that money on the things that need it, like uh, Early Childhood Education, a Just Transition Act. Uh, I'm just thrilled with this initiative I've seen from some feminists uh, for a care economy. Make this uh, budget a care budget and make this election a care election. Uh, from my old colleague, Laurel Ritchie and others, uh, I think that's a fabulous way to frame the choices that we face. And uh, in fact, uh, I think we can fight for and win those demands. I think many Canadians would certainly share that view, Jim. And uh, you know, you've know, you made the very good point that this is, this is about the long haul. It can't just be a one-off. So back to you, Leah. Um, I mean, I, you're right there in the middle of it. Um, so just to, in terms of the federal budget, um, how are you how are you seeing the leverage that you might have as a new Democrat with your with your leader Jagmeet Singh? Um, do you feel that there is some leverage that you can use here to and what what are the issues that you're looking for? What are the the things that you want addressed in this federal budget? Then we'll go Just to poll. Sure. Just going back, I think even when we look at the recovery after the war, I mean, the recovery, again, in that circumstance was only for a select few. And I would argue that certainly Indigenous peoples uh, at the time were not part of the growing prosperity in the country. And I think we see that over and over again, certainly uh, I was debating, as I indicated, Bill C-15, talking about how the poverty and wealth of this country has been born on the wrongful and violent dispossession of Indigenous lands uh, and also uh, resulted in at epidemic levels of violence against Indigenous women and girls to us LGBTQQIA. I think we need to get real about this discussion because often these discussions about what goes in budget budgets is with the exclusion of BIPOC voices. I see that uh, again, certainly uh, our party has made tremendous strides. The, for example, even with the wage subsidy, you know, pushing from it to go from 10% to 75%. Uh, you know, much of what we've achieved uh, during the CERB uh, or during the pandemic, even pushing the government more on, even though they voted against our bill, for a universal pharmacare program, feeling the pressure. So certainly I think New Democrats have been key in pushing the government to do the right thing. We've been talking about things like a universal dental care program and really addressing the she recovery by pushing for a national child care program, something the Liberals, as I indicated, have been promising um, for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, you know, we need, however, immediate and substantial investment in an economy that allows us to divest from fossil fuels. Let's get real. We know there's a direct correlation between the pandemic and the climate emergency. If we do not address the climate emergency we are in, we are going to continue to have uh, pandemics. This is happening. And one of the direct reasons it, court reasons it is happening is because we are in a climate emergency, we need to address this immediately. And then lastly, I don't think it's any secret that I've been really pushing for a guaranteed livable basic income, uh, building on income guarantees that we currently have. We have income guarantees, OAS is an example of that. I'm saying it's not livable. I'm saying we need to increase those income guarantees and expand them out and certainly heed the call to justice 4.5 uh, in the National Inquiry into murdered and missing indigenous women and girls who noted in 4.5 to put in place a guaranteed livable income for Canadians and Indigenous peoples because we know there's a direct correlation between violence and the murder of Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit and poverty and being unsheltered. So those are things I'd like to see in addition to the many progressive um, items our party is pushing for. Um, and. Uh, of course, major, massive investment 
uh, in affordable, accessible social housing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know in my riding, people's lives are on the line because they are unsheltered. Uh, they can't do things like socially isolate and wash their hands. When we talk about all these kind of middle class privileges of staying safe during the pandemic, I think it's important to remember that many people don't even have the privilege as we see in First Nations uh, communities, uh, access to clean drinking water, proper housing, so you're not housed with 20 people. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many items I'd like to see. And I think the NDP mm -hmm. has pushed these things that aren't even on the agenda of other parties. Well, I'm sure glad you're there, Leah, with your with your colleagues to push that. And now coming to you, Paul, I mean, you're right on the ground there in Toronto. And I, I'm, you know, in looking at the federal budget, just I, do you feel that there's sort of a disconnect to like folks that you're working with who are really struggling to survive? I mean, are they, are people even, is it even on their radar about a, a federal budget? Um, you know, we, we could get so in a bubble in Ottawa, right? And all the pundits and all the speculation, but we are talking about real issues that affect people in their daily lives, whether they, whether they, whether they live in, or die in some circumstances. So Paul, how does it feel to you in terms of the, the federal budget um, and the work that you're doing in Toronto? I guess, Libby, the first thing I would say, you know, is that people are preoccupied with the vaccine and they're preoccupied with um, the, the folks that we work with want to get the vaccine. And there are all kinds of hurdles and, and, and challenges that we're seeing in terms of access to the vaccine. But even before that, I want to come back to the piece around, you know, guaranteed livable income. You know, I think CERB has done something really significant and we need to continue that conversation. You know, in this country right now, there are five and a half million people that are food insecure, don't know where their food's gonna come from. And I think we have an opportunity to really learn from this experience uh, of CERB. You know, when it comes to food access, one of the things we've seen is, you know, the $2,000 CERB has actually caused food bank usage in smaller communities to decrease but we've seen increases in cities like Toronto. So I think we've got to have a conversation. There's some learning that needs to happen there. We need to figure out what is it that people need exactly? How much do people need to be able to, to survive? And I think that has to be encompassed in a human rights framework that doesn't um, see services slashed and, and cut. The other thing I'm going to say is, you know, we, we can't forget that we don't have a vaccine for climate change. And folks for a very long time have been calling for a Green New Deal, a just transition. You know, these things aren't slogans. This is, you know, a framework for thinking about how we use public money to combat some of the issues that we face. You know, prioritizing Indigenous voices, prior, prioritizing folks of color who have been left out of these conversations, as Leah mentioned, and the leadership uh, from these communities to be able to think about how do we combat this climate crisis? Crisis. How do we combat the housing crisis and how do we use a significant investment of public dollars to be able to do those things together? I think one of the scariest things is that we've been convinced that this type of mobilization to tackle these existential threats just isn't possible. And that to me is really dangerous because the minute we believe that we're doomed. You know, and I could rattle off a long list of policies, but I think what I really need and what I'm hearing from folks in my community and the folks that we work with at FoodShare is people need hope. You know, I want to see hope in this budget. I want us to be able to believe in government, to believe that we can collectively defeat anything that threatens us, you know, be it climate change, systemic racism, income inequality, or even the housing crisis. Right now, I think this government has an opportunity, and I think it's an opportunity to prove that the social contract is still good. You know, I'm an optimistic guy, which is hard, uh, especially with this government, but I genuinely, genuinely and truly hope that the Trudeau government doesn't take that away from me and Canadians right across this country. You know, I want Canada to lead and inspire the way that we can and should, and that's what I want to see in this budget. Well, we love your optimism, Paul. <laughs> Keep you know, never lose it, okay? Um, but I'm really glad you raised the issue of, of 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 what's really top of mind for people, which is the vaccination program. And I'm gonna because we've got lots of questions coming in already, so I'm gonna jump right into our last question, which is sort of more political speculation. And I'm gonna ask Carl to lead up on lead off on this, and that is, you know, given what we're facing, we're still in a pandemic where people are still wanting to get this vaccination underway we're waiting here in bc as well like everywhere else um, as, as people wait their turn so if the liberals decide to engineer a federal election are they gambling on seizing the day to win a majority and you know is this a wise move and what are the risks for for canadians so carl why don't you have a go at that i mean i think it's an unwise move in the, in the broader sense of what's a humane and decent and right thing to do. 
but in, in the narrow sense, politically advantageous, liberal strategists and liberal activists are to have been talking for months about they're hungering to have an election. From, the, from their point of view, you know, simply looking at politics as a chess game and not politics as a way of making life better for people, the chess, the chess pieces are sitting pretty for them now. Even, even given all the problems of the vaccine rollout, everything bad that's happening, of the, of the horrible crisis that we're in, in the third wave now in Ontario, weirdly, all the opinion polls show them doing well. You can imagine them looking and saying, and you know, their thought is, I'm interrupting myself here, you look at all these opinion polls, you look at the fact that uh, the conservative leader hasn't exactly caught on. You look at the fact that they're able to co-opt in the minds of many commentators and voters, co-opt a lot of what the NDP stands for and, and limit, the, limit the extent to which the NDP could expand. And you look at the fact that most Canadians see Trudeau as a kind of the prime minister. There's a natural tendency for people, they'll say, it, it, it serves their agenda to have an election when there's still a crisis on. And, you know, and they look at John, what happened to Mr. Horgan, and they look at even in Newfoundland, where the election was a fiasco, but from the point of view of the governing party, they went from a minority to majority. So we had two cases where they had minorities, Newfoundland and BC. In Newfoundland, the entire election was a fiasco because of the pandemic, but they still won the majority, despite the fiasco. In British Columbia, Mr. Horgan got criticized for holding a premature election, although he was already in his defense three years into his mandate. Still, he won a majority. They want to have an election, that, like they really do. Uh, that's what they want to do. And that is very evident. distressing and terribly yeah. wrong, but that's what they want to do. Yeah, I, and I think you put that very well, Carl, that that's definitely what they want on their agenda. Uh, but there is a risk in terms of how Canadians will react to that. So um, we get, we've got lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to move right on to the questions because uh, we've got about another 15 minutes left. Um, and I, I'm going to invite all of you to respond to the uh, questions. The first question is actually from Romeo Saganash, a former MP and a, 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 was a great MP and a great activist. And his question is, this pandemic has revealed many inequalities and inequities that existed in our society. But even worse, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. How will the next budget address that despicable state of affairs? Uh, anybody like to, to respond to that one from Romeo? Well, the, the strict answer to the question is, it's not going to address that despicable <laughs> state of affairs. And that's unfortunate. And there are things that could be done. Uh, honestly, if there's anything that should get us out in the streets with torches in our hands, it should be the accumulation of billionaire wealth during the pandemic, the amount of money that was made by large corporations, including here in Canada, while the rest of the planet suffered is absolutely unconscionable. And we, at a minimum, should have things like uh, changes in the capital gains tax or a wealth tax or other ways to have them pay their share. But we are not gonna see that on yep. Monday. I'm gonna move on to the uh, next question because I think it's it, it really hits a point. Um, it's from uh, Riel Laverne. It, it, and what he says is, it seems very likely that we will uh, that we'll get a very progressive sounding budget, but can we trust the Liberals to deliver if we have an election based on this budget? So I think that's a pretty good question. Um, and uh, maybe Leah, would you like to uh, to take a, a a response to that? Well, without uh, sounding cheeky, I mean, let's get real. Like they're talking about a national childcare program. You know, I've, I was in committee, I asked the minister about it. She said, well, you know, we're in COVID. I, she, I said, it's been 20, 28 years. And she said, well, we've been in COVID. I said, okay, 27 years. I mean, you know, the Liberals have had, you know, so many uh, uh, opportunities as government uh, to put in place these programs that they promise time and time and time and again, and they just do not deliver. And, you know, I can tell you, uh, people uh, certainly promises that are even really hurtful. I can tell you the fact that we had a national inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. We know that rates of violence against women have gone up 400% in some areas and using COVID as an excuse when you know that rates of violence are going uh, going up as much as 400% against women, girls, 2SLGBTQQIA, that's the time to make real investment. And I can tell you it's about choices. It's about spending almost $6 billion 
on bailing out Air, Air Canada with benefits for executives at the top. I've seen lots of choices, including the first bailout being uh, being pipeline. So no, uh, I do not trust uh, their agenda. I think the Liberals have a history uh, of campaigning on the left and running on the, the right. And I think we just have to calculate how much money was given to corporation how much money they refuse to collect from offshore tax havens, a wealth tax, taxing the ultra rich, uh, you know, bailing out uh, big corporations and looking at buying military jets and all of these things during a pandemic to figure out where their priorities are. And I can tell you, it's not people and it's not human rights. Yep. Okay. Um, another question uh, from Drummond who says, I understand that the federal government is now buying a minority position in a pharmacy medical facility that they sold to a European uh, company. Um, any thoughts from anyone? I think it's possibly referring to the uh, Sanofi, uh, which the feds are giving money to, to open a new vaccine production facility in the old Connaught labs, which we know was a publicly owned um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical um, production facility. So uh, any, any, does anyone have any information on, on this particular question? If not, we can just move on and, and suggest the person. Yeah, Paul. I could just add that I think it's, you know, it's a little bit ludicrous. Again, another wasted opportunity. Here we are giving money to corporations um, when we could be thinking about, you know, in this, in this pandemic, we've had to rely on big pharma to save us. And I think we really need to be thinking about what's our national capacity, what's, how can we as a country, as Canada, produce the types of medicine that we need and think about nationalizing pharma. I think these are the kinds of big conversations that we need to be having. And that's the kind of stuff that's going to protect our health security in the long term, not continuing to double down on uh, reliance on big pharma. Yeah, and I think, um, Jim, if I could switch back to you, I think that relates back to um, the question of, that you raised earlier about a care budget. I think that's what you called it that's been put forward by um, a number of women across the country. And I, I mean, I think you know that whole question that seems to be gaining some momentum that people are getting it, that we, we need to have a budget that responds to the real needs of people. Um, so it, it just any further thoughts on on how how can we how can we uh, I mean you're an economist but it seems to me that we need to link up these uh, questions around the economy and, and make them popular with people and and show people how they can move those questions forward in a real political way way oh you're quite right Libby in fact uh, this subject is far too important to be left to the economists uh, it has to be the rest of society that makes these decisions about what's important and what are our priorities. And, uh, and this is, again, where we've got a humongous opening right now. The purpose of government is not to balance its books. No one in Canada believes that anymore. The purpose of government is to protect citizens and protect our lives and our health and our environment and our communities. And what's more, government has virtually unlimited financial resources to do that with. So in a way, it's a whole new ball game. And I love this idea of the care economy. I just think it's a fabulous frame. And um, um, it, it should be the fiscal anchor. You know how there's all this discussion about we need a fiscal anchor. This is coming from the architects of austerity who know they'll be laughed out of the room if they called for a balanced budget right now. So they can't do that. So they're trying to come up with you know, balanced budget light in essence, is what that is. A fiscal anchor is their way of saying, okay, well, we're not going to balance the budget, but we still want some kind of hard and fast constraint on what government can't and can't do. We should say, no, the actual anchor for the budget should be the health and well-being of Canadians. That's what budgets are supposed to be all about. We've been fighting for that for years through the alternative federal budget and other projects to say it's all about choices. And uh, if anything, we have proven in the last year that we have unlimited choices. We just have to have the political force to push the government to actually do the right thing. Okay, thanks, Jim. Very good point. Um, back to another question um, from Rick, who says, if Parliament were a proportionally represented one, do you think it could have handled this pandemic better than we have to date? Uh, Carl and, and maybe Paul, you'd like to uh, respond to that. Well, the funny thing is, the funny thing is that advocates of electoral reform uh, would like to get an election. They, they want reform so that we'd have an election that produces results more or less like the results we got last time with first past the post. So the problem is not, I mean, sometimes first past the post actually more or less gives you what the voters 
voted for it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, obviously there are imbalances here and there. I mean, it's ridiculous that the Bloc Québécois gets more seats uh, than the NDP when they only run candidates in one province and their total popular vote, of course, is way less than the NDP. But leaving that aside, the problem is not then right now, the electoral system is that we're not living with the democratic choice uh, that we've made, which is that the people were putting in place 338 members of parliament and implicitly saying to them, figure it out, work together. I mean, my, here's my fantasy. I wrote a fantasy when the liberals got in trouble on the weed scandal. I, I said, here's my fantasy world. When the liberals got elected, uh, Justin Trudeau said, we only got you know 32 or 33 percent of the vote. We didn't even get the most votes, but we represent the progressive majority. Just add NDP vote, vote and add the green vote to ours and we're the real majority. But he didn't follow through saying, if you're going to take credit for those voters, if you're going to say those voters are sort of mine as much as they are uh, Leah's and as much as they are Elizabeth May's and the others, why don't you then offer them a share of the power? You're saying these are, these, I claim these voters. These voters are really for me, even though they didn't check my party off. But he didn't follow the logical corollary and say, okay, we're going to have a government which we share power with these people. Of course not. They want to have a government where the cabinet meeting is as much a meeting about a Liberal Party strategy as it is about governing Canada. So they don't want to let you in. And, and I said, if they had these people in the room with, you know, Jagmeet Singh were the, uh, were the finance minister sitting in the room and they brought these wee people in, one of them would say, what's this all about? This, is, this looks too fishy. They wouldn't, they would never would have gone ahead with it because you would have had people from other parties who didn't have, who didn't owe their life uh, and career to the, to the Liberal Party saying, this is a really dumb idea, folks. You're going to get in trouble for it. And it would have saved them a lot of embarrassment. But that's just on the we issue. So the, the, the problem is that we don't have a concept in this country of sharing and cooperating. Uh, we, we have this one, we have this notion of a sports game that one somebody wins. Stephen Harper put it so bluntly when he almost got thrown out of power and we almost had a coalition government. He said the losers are trying to steal power from the winner. No. The people who represented 55 or 56 percent of the voters uh, wanted to have power. They were as much the winner. They were the real winners in the election, even though he had more seats. So, but he, we, we, I think that is the, that is the, now. Of course, had we a different electoral system that always produced these results, we'd get used to it, and maybe our political culture would change. But okay. I mean, I think it's really too bad that the pandemic I'm gonna didn't drop, teach us I'm that. Gonna... I'm going to jump in there, um, uh, Carl. I know we could talk a lot more about um, the whole electoral system, but it was a it was a good question that came up. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, um, and it's it's actually um, it's a very interesting question from I believe it's Judy Rebeck, um, and and basically what she's saying is that. Um, the childcare advocates that she knows in Toronto or believe that there will be uh, a national childcare program this time around. But the problem is, um, will it be enough providing enough funding uh, to the nonprofit sector and, and public care as opposed to, you know, a program that is delivered uh, to private corporations where they get all the money? I mean, this is something to really worry about. And then in addition, um, we to make sure that there's direct funding rather than tax deductions. And is this something that the NDP is focusing on and taking up? So, uh, Paul, maybe you could start out quickly on just sort of the broader question about public versus private. And then, Leah, I'll ask you to finish up by just addressing, you know, what the NDP is taking up on the childcare question in terms of how it should be funded. So, Paul, just any thoughts you have? First of all, hi, Judy. And uh, second, I think this question is a brilliant one. And I think we need to be interrogating it now because what we've seen, no, they're not. The first thing I'll say is they're not going to, it's not very likely that they're going to provide the type of funding that um, uh, not-for-profit op operators will require to be able to animate the type of childcare that we need, quality childcare. You know, what we've seen is the government over relies on charity. Um, and uses charity to make these big announcements to address these wicked problems. 
Food insecurity is a great example. You know, I mentioned that we've got over 5 million people that are food insecure in this country. Well, what does the government do? Um, donates $50 million to, to charities. Well, that's a drop in the bucket in terms of the scale of the problem. So we really need to make sure that we're advocating for a response that's in line with the scale of the problem. And that if, we're, if we want to have quality care, that it rests in, in for, it's a um, uh, nonprofit is adequately funded to be able to deliver on quality care through decent work and the like. Okay, last word to you, uh, Leah, in terms of um, what, what, what is the NDP pushing for in terms of uh, childcare and the way it's funded? Sure, I just want to give you a fast fact. So my first career was as an early childhood educator, in fact, and, you know, back then we were fighting the same fights that we're fighting now. And that was 100 million years ago. Uh, I'm, I, I'm almost 50 now. Uh, but I've actually been working with the National Union of um, Public and General Employees, uh, pushing for their for their agenda. Uh, for a national child care plan that's accessible, that's affordable, and also includes what Paul was talking about, supporting child care workers. You know, in Manitoba, we had a campaign, for example, fighting for um, nothing less than $21,000 a year. $21,000 a year. I mean, can you imagine uh, how uh, devalued early childhood educators have been that they are only asking for $21,000, often with no benefits. One of the reasons why I left childcare, even though uh, I, I really enjoyed it, and saying that we need to support workers, we need to make it affordable, we need to make it accessible, and we need to support workers and ma to make sure that we have high quality childcare. So I agree with Judy. I think there's a real danger uh, to putting in place a national system that is privatized, that is not uh, uh, open for families that might at different income levels. We need a national child care strategy that is affordable, accessible, and of high quality. Hey, thanks, Leah. Well, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we've got for the questions because I, I do run a pretty tight ship here and I want to make sure that we finish on time or very close to. So I, first of all, I want to say you guys are so terrific. Um, it's just a pleasure to have you in conversation because you're progressive people. You know what's going on. You're on the ground. So thank you so much to our panelists, Carl Nuremberg, Leah Gazan, Paul Taylor, and our special guest today, Jim Stanford. Um, I think, you know, we just know from all the questions coming in, we could have gone on longer that people have really enjoyed hearing your perspective on what you have to say and the information you have to offer. Um, I really hope the liberals and hey, even the conservatives are listening. Um, before I turn over the last word to my co-host, Robin Brown, who I introduced at the beginning, I just want to note that viewers, to the viewers, you should feel that you can add your ideas for future shows in the chat. So we're, we're gonna do more of these panels. Uh, we love your ideas. So put in there anything that you wanna see come up. And I also wanna give a big shout out to Rabble. 20 years strong this weekend, wow. In fact, Judy Rabbit was uh, the founder along with a few other people. I can't believe that it's been 20 years. That's quite remarkable. So folks, I'm being very um, um, transparent here. Please consider making a donation to keep um, this independent progressive media going. And now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Robin Brown. Thanks, Libby. Um, I, I've been a fan of Rabble and the show uh, for a long time, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of this. Uh, yeah, we do want to hear from viewers uh, what you'd like to focus or us to focus on in our May off the Hill panel. So as Libby said, please share your thoughts in the chat here on Zoom. Uh, and to stay connected and get updates on future shows, sign up to Rabble's free weekly e email news alerts at rabble.ca slash alerts. That's rabble.ca slash alert. So uh, time to sign off for now and we look forward to uh, seeing you the next time. Bye everyone. <laughs>